So first off, I just want to introduce my talk against the zeitgeist. Unfortunately for you and for me, there aren't any images in my talk. We're bombarded with images. Images are everywhere. Not only are they everywhere, they're constantly demanding something from us. Usually they're demanding some kind of response, emotion, especially judgment. Judgment comes from images. They're asking us to position ourselves against an idea or a value. And I find it pretty exhausting. So what I'm going to do is old school. I've got paper, nothing on any screen, sorry. And that's terrifying for all of us, you and me. I don't have any prompts. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the core principles of what a university tutor told me when I was studying to become a teacher. She said to me, if you're ever placed on a casual class and it's a year seven class on a Friday afternoon, last period of the day, end of the term, what do you do? Firstly, you panic. Secondly, you make sure you have a book in your bag. And you do that because everyone is happy to listen to a story, put their head on the desk and relax. And so I invite you now to listen to a story that I'm going to tell you, a series of short stories actually, about my reading history and what I've learnt from that. When I was, well, maybe I won't tell you my age, but in 2002, a friend of mine told me, hey, I've read this book called Atonement, and I think you'd really enjoy it. I was, okay, fine. And when I next saw it in a bookshop, I brought it home and I started reading it. In case you don't know, it's a story that opens with a young girl, Bryony, and she's putting on a play. She's putting on a play with an intense passion. She is so excited about this play, but she needs her cousin's help to be able to put it on. Lola's her older cousin. Lola, eh, she's not so engaged. She doesn't really care about the play in the same way that Bryony does, and Bryony's infuriated by this. But there's a moment, a moment in the rehearsals where Bryony looks at Lola's indifference, her nonchalance, and she says to herself, I'm a child. Lola is an adult. Something is missing here. I am on the other side of something, something I don't understand, something I don't recognize, but I'm on this side of that and she's on the other side. When I read the opening 20 pages of this story, I felt like I'd been slapped across the face. I was immediately transported to when I was 13 and I was momentarily staying at my aunt's house. My older cousin, Michelle, she was cool. She was 17, I was 13. Awkward, nerdy, I know it's hard to imagine. But what I realized one afternoon was as we shared the lounge watching the ads on TV, an ad for an animated film came on. And she said, I really want to go and see that film. And she said it completely seriously. There was, there was no hint of irony there. And I looked at her and I realized that she was in some way untouchable to me. She had moved into a distant space where she was capable of saying something like that in response to a child's film. If I'd said something like that, I'm still the child. I did still want to go and see the film. I wasn't going to say it though. But she was adult and I wasn't. And when I read the opening of Atonement, I was absolutely gobsmacked. I could not believe that an old British man could understand and articulately discuss the ideas and experiences that I thought were unique to me. Not only did I think they were unique to me, I thought I was a genius 
for having recognised what had happened on that lounge that day. I thought that I had come across some incredible social idea that I was going to explain in the future to generations of people. I thought at 13, I knew it. And then Ian McEwan got in front of me. He wrote it beautifully, he explained it. And what that told me was, reading is actually humbling. People will tell you to read because of empathy. People will tell you to read because of connection. But in fact, what that connection does is make us humble. What we should do when we're reading these experiences is actually understand that it's not about us being seen. It's actually about us seeing others. Let me tell you another story. One day when I was 12, a lot of these stories are happening in those, those early days. When I was 12, I was at my mother's friend's house and on a matter of great principle, which of course is now long forgotten, I came out to the car determined never to enter the house again. That was it. And I sat out there in the streets, in the car, in the heat, and there was a knock on the window. Can't believe I'm going to say this, but I wound down the window. Many of you have no idea what I'm talking about. There used to be a winder on the window of a car and back in the dark ages. And he leant through the window and he said to me, with reservoirs of patience that my mother didn't, he said, at least if you're going to be by yourself out in the car, have a good book to read. He walked, uh, sorry, he leant through the window and he handed me Carrie by Stephen King. Now, I don't know if any of you know that particular book, uh, not known for its, uh, the, its high reading lists on 12-year-old girl interests, uh, but I found it fascinating. It was an adult book in my hand, and as I sat there in the car, furious, my fury faded, and I read about an ostracised girl with the power of telekinesis, which meant that she could move things just by thinking about them. That sounded like an enticing idea. And I was propelled from that moment on into a world of adult reading, reading that was about big ideas, scary ideas, experimentation. And I ended up, from that moment on, having bad haircuts, dark ideas, experimentation, yeah. But you know what? I did all of that sitting in a classroom quietly, long, straight hair, good friendships, clean lungs, early nights. All of my experiences were done by characters. I had characters make all of my bad decisions for me. And what I found was when I looked around my friends, I realized that those of my friends who weren't letting characters make those bad decisions for them, they were making them on their own, in the real world, with real consequences. In 2010, a woman called Eileen Reynolds wrote a piece for The New Yorker entitled, Should Criminals Be Sentenced to Read? <laughs> Instead of going on a community service program, juvenile, uh, juvenile offenders were invited to engage in a reading program instead. They thought that wisdom could be offered through text. Now they didn't say, let's go on a film excursion, let's go and watch films about people making bad decisions. Images demand from us. They bring us in really quickly and they ask us to make judgments in a snap second. In the novel, we're invited to sit, to consider. Those plots and characters, they're not going to demand anything from us straight away. We don't even know who they are or what they're doing. We don't know where they are or what the options might be. And as a consequence, reading fiction offers us safe wisdom. And that safety is so important when we're teenagers, and when we're young adults. And so if parents come to me and they say, we're actually concerned about a book that might be on your reading list or something that 
my child might be reading in the, on their own. Is it appropriate? Everything's appropriate. In fact, teenagers should be encouraged to read everything, especially what's inappropriate, because they're seeing other people make those decisions, seeing the consequences of them, experiencing from a safe distance. That wisdom is incredibly powerful, and you can take that information with you into adulthood. I remember when I, was, uh, when I was thinking about what I was going to talk about today, I knew that reading would be at the heart of it. And that's because reading's at the heart of a lot of what I do. When I was in year nine, I had, a, I had one of those teachers. I had one of those teachers. I'd always wanted one. Inspiring, amazing. I only had one. It was Ms. Brockman. Year nine, social science. And one afternoon, I came in from lunch and I was still reading my book. And I really didn't want to stop reading it. Did not want to put it down. She saw that. And in an act of incredible respect and kindness, which I've never forgotten, obviously, she took me to the back of the classroom. She sat me down at a desk in a chair and she said, read your book. And she went on and she taught the lesson. She taught the lesson to the entire class and I'm sure I missed out on some important activities. And uh, they all left the classroom and I just finished, just as the class left. And she came over to me and she said, hey, do you want to talk about what you just read? And I looked at her astonished. I had never had an adult who had read the book that I had read or even want to engage in a conversation about what it is that I've been reading. And we spent the next 15 minutes engaged in incredible discussion about huge ideas, characters who made incredible decisions, and societies that made no sense. And as she spooled Nanook of the North back onto the projector for the next class to come in, she said to me, this has been such a great conversation. And in that moment, the dynamic between us was recalibrated. We were both readers sharing ideas. And in fact, those ideas are things that I still think about today. In fact, they're not just things that I think about today. They're things that I think about every term four when I go in front of a class and start introducing 1984. And 1984, as a 14-year-old, it's probably a different experience to what many of you are having when you read 1984 as a 17-year-old. But as a 14-year-old, I was challenged by that book. I was invited to come into a world for which I was completely unprepared. It was a complex book. It has long sentences, archaic words, a vocabulary that I had no connection with. In fact, no one has a connection with it. There are a lot of neologisms in there. And when I read that book, I was made an adult in that conversation with Ms. Brockman. I feel as though today we often fail our teenagers. We try to keep them away from classic novels, great experiences, because we're scared that they're going to be turned off by long sentences and hard words. And I feel like that's a real injustice because those conversations that we have as adults, Parents, teachers, just next generation, when we're speaking with people of different generations, those books as a, act as a meaningful cornerstone of what it means to be a citizen in society. And I know that from my own experience as a student reading it. And that's why I'm so privileged every year as a high school English teacher to have those same conversations with my students. A conversation that happens regularly in my house is one about books. And one that happened a while ago, when my children were younger, our favourite family book is Harriet the Spy. Now, you probably have never heard of this book. It's by Louise Fitzhugh, and it's about Harriet, a primary school young girl who's a spy. She's got a spy logbook, she's got a spy belt, She's got a spy outfit. She even has a spy route that she goes on each day after school. She makes notes in that book. 
And as a family, we love talking about what it would be like to have a spy route, to have those adventures. But there was something different between when my daughter read the book and when my son read the book. When my daughter read the book, she read the book, she got the outfit, I made her the belt, and we had great games, discussions, fun. When my son read the book, he was about five, and we would go out to cafes, he'd read when we were out with friends, or he'd go to the park and be finishing the book. And every single time, someone would comment on the fact that he was reading a book that had a girl on the front. I mean, to be fair, most of the time, these people were complimentary. Most of the time, these people were saying, oh, that's so wonderful. Oh, isn't it nice? He's reading a book about a girl. Funnily enough, when my daughter read the same book, no one made a comment. And even more funnily enough, when my daughter read Harry Potter, no one came up to her and said, how are you finding that book about a boy? Are you able to understand what's happening? We do a great disservice to the young men in our society. We do a great disservice when we look at the books that they're reading and curate them before they even get a chance to engage with them. Before they even get to reading age, most of the picture books that we give our young boys have gendered animals in them. Most of the non-fiction that we give to our children, we give to boys, we don't give to girls. There have been many, many studies done. There is so much research. I could have done an entire talk on this particular topic, and in fact I have, on the fact that boys' literacy levels are dropping, dropping much faster than girls' literacy levels. But ironically, those same adults who are intervening, who are trying to get boys to read more, who are presenting them with male characters and adventure stories and war tales, who are focusing on plot rather than introspection and character, those same adults, I think, are ironically engaging in the very limitation that is preventing boys from doing their best in literacy. Because this is happening from a really young age. Parents are so paranoid about their boys not reading. They come to me all the time asking me, what can I do to get my boys to read? And if I suggest books that have women or girls as protagonists, they question me. They suggest and challenge that their boys aren't going to be interested in that story. Let's think about that. If girls do not have the same restrictions on their reading from a really young age, if their reading experiences are broad and brilliant, doesn't it make sense that their engagement with literacy is going to be higher? We get them to inhabit the experiences of others who are really fundamentally different from them in all kinds of ways, without interruption. Our paranoia about boys' literacy sees us intervening, interrupting, in, 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 uh, engaging with them in a way that is inappropriate. I believe that the inappropriateness of this division between girls' books and boys' books is at the heart of our problems with literacy. Boys' literacy is not a problem when we start realising that boys will read girls' stories. Boys will read human stories. At the end of this, I'm going to come back to how I started, which is that we live in a time of zeitgeist with images. Images are everywhere. Images demand from us. Images drive us to judgment. But when we sit here, just you and me, having a conversation, telling stories, when it's just me sitting in a room with a book, or it's just me sitting with my family all quietly, individually, reading books, we're not demanded to do anything. In fact, we're slowly invited to see a world outside of where we are. And reading fiction doesn't demand from us. 
it actually offers us wisdom and humility. What we need is the humility and wisdom to start reading in the first place. Thank you.